Okay, so let's pray. Loving God, we pray that you'd open our minds and our hearts, that we might know more of you, and that we might explore and learn more deeply. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay, so um, we're looking at the Trinity. Uh, is, I was actually asked to have a little look at this by, by someone. So if you have any topics that you want me to look at, let me know. And I started with uh, one of my favorite images of the Trinity, which is a sketch by William Blake. And it was in one of his notebooks. And I like it because it, it, it's very dynamic. It's not overly fussy or anything like that. It's just got a, kind of a nice uh, look to it. And what it is, is it's the Holy Spirit hovering over the Father who's holding his Son, who's in the position of, of the one crucified. So we get that kind of, uh, that, that particular moment. And interestingly, if you think about it, 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 it pulls together three of the different depictions we have of God in Scripture. There's the Holy Spirit, which is most frequently, in fact, in that kind of the dove form, is a baptism image. Uh, there's the crucifixion of Jesus, and then there's the Father in that sort of the holding, loving embrace. And also, you've probably seen various different versions of what's called the shield of the Trinity. Um, and that's got, you know, there's the sort of the center of the shield has God, uh, and then the three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and, Ho uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then there's lines joining them, and it says, you know, uh, the Father is not the Spirit, the Father is not the Son, but they all are God. And there's a very uh, old depiction of that there. It's from around, uh, what do they reckon? Around the year 1210. So <laughs> as an idea, it's been around for a long time. Um, and so you, you've seen it around. So I, w I wanted to put those there. Went to Wikipedia to grab a definition, if you will, for what the Trinity is. And the Wikipedia definition there is, the Christian doctrine of the Trinity holds that God is one God, but three co-eternal, consubstantial person, persons or hypostases, the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, as one God in three divine persons. That should clear that up. Um, <laughs> any questions? No? We done? Um, no, look, I... <laughs> uh, there's a lot of language in there that I think we need to unpack. So the first thing I want to talk about is monotheism. Monotheism obviously translates to one God. Mono, one, uh, as the kids in school used to tell me, monobrow, one eyebrow, uh, one God. Um... And there are sort of two aspects to it. There is sort of the philosophical, uh, the doctrine or belief that there is only one God. So that's um, where Christians are. It's also where Jews and Muslims are. Um, and it's what it's saying is that there is one God. And what I did is I wanted to grab a piece of scripture there that sort of pointed to that. Uh, and so in Deuteronomy, Chapter 10, verse 17, and all the scripture passages that I'm using come from the NRSV. Uh, For the Lord our God is God of gods and Lord of lords, lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribes. And the reason I wanted that passage particularly is it uh, comes from a time in Israel's history when they are actually in an environment where many different people worship many different gods. So uh, it, it's not yet in history, but think of the Greeks and the Romans who had Zeus and Apollo and um, uh, Jupiter and all the rest of it. And what that instruction to the people of Israel was about was both about understanding that God is their God and that they should, uh, you know, um, that that's who they worship. But it's also creating a distinction between 
and in the NRSV they use an uppercase and a lowercase. There are these gods of, you know, the Babylonians and the Phoenicians and the and all the rest of it, and the Egyptians. And then there is God. And in a way that kind of comes back to, you know, Genesis chapter 1, uh, and it's sort of there is one God. Uh, even if there might possibly be spiritual beings who are significantly more powerful than us. So that definition of God doesn't preclude, um, say, Zeus or Jupiter or or any of the others. Uh, but rather what it says is that those would also be creatures like you and I. They would be not God. They might be powerful, but just powerful isn't enough to be God. So that's sort of philosophical monotheism. Uh, my understanding is that um, even Hinduism is functionally philosophically monotheistic, although I'm not a Hindu scholar, so that's a very shallow understanding. There's also kind of a functional monotheism, uh, which many people would be, and it would have been. That is, you, you're you willing to accept that, hey, sure, uh, there may be many other gods, you know, the Jews can have a god, and the, and the Romans could have a bunch, but, you know, in, in my household or in my village, we worship this one particular god. Um, and interestingly, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, which is part of the Ten Commandments, that's almost the idea that you get. You, get. you shall have no other gods before me. It's not saying there are no other gods or, you know, they've just come out of Egypt. It's not saying that the, the Egyptian gods are not there, in a sense. What it's saying is that you must be functional monotheists. And... Trinitarian theology comes out of a firm commitment to the former. It comes out of a firm commitment to philosophical monotheism. There can be only one God. Um, essentially, there can only either be God or no God, not many gods. When your proposition for God includes ultimate source of existence and being. You can't have two ultimate sources of existence. <clears throat> um, there's another word in there, which is consubstantial. So three, co-eternal, consubstantial. Uh, and the language there comes out of, it comes out of substance and accident. Um, and so substance is the idea that this is, what is true of a thing regardless of an, obser of an observer. And the accident is not necessarily the case. And I found an awesome picture of a tree falling in a forest. Because I was thinking about that when I did engineering a, at university in South Africa, which is now quite a long time ago, um, I remember we had one of these people, you know, asking us, you know, the philosophical questions. If a tree falls in a forest and no one's here, there to hear it, does it still make a noise? And all the engineers turned around and went, yes. Because for us, the definition of noise was about uh, a compression wave traveling through the air. Uh, and it, 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 it didn't matter whether that hit an eardrum, which then triggered nerves, which then kind of received in part of the brain. The definition of noise was the compressions in the air. But if you think about it, noise was never compressions in the air until we started to learn about these things. Noise was always that which was heard. And so it, it needed a receiver. So compressions in the air only become noise when they hit an eardrum. Now, obviously, in a forest, there's all sorts of creatures that have eardrums, and, uh, and it's just a sort of uh, an idle piece of philosophy. Um, but there's another example that might be really interesting to people of this. And it's in one of Shakespeare's tragedies. It's the, probably the most famous line. If I say Shakespearean tragedy, you're probably thinking, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? And um, I remember... My mum, actually, I think it was, telling me 
that that's not asking where is Romeo. Juliet's not sitting on the balcony, you know, where's Romeo in the crowd or anything like that. She's asking the question, why are you Romeo? It's a tragedy, obviously. And, and so she's fallen in love with the substance of Romeo, uh, possibly. I mean, she may have fallen in love with Romeo because he's the forbidden fruit and all the rest of it. But in theory, she's fallen in love with the substance of Romeo. This is, oh, you know, this 15-year-old boy I'm in love with forever. Um, but she's frustrated by the accident of his life. The fact that he is part of the political uh, and family group he is and the political circumstances. So we get the substance, his personhood and the accident, all those other things around him. And so in that Trinitarian theology, we get this notion that regardless of the accident, the, the way in which the three persons of God uh, interact or appear, they have the same substance. These days we might say essence uh, or something like that. Uh, okay, so, yes, um, consubstantial persons or hypostasis. Um, Hypostasis is from Greek. You know, hippopotamus. Hippopotamus translates water horse. Uh, so uh, hippos is to do with water, and stasis is, is the stationary bit, the water bit, the, the, the bed of the river. And so regardless of where you're at in the river, it has the riverbed that is consistent across its entire being. So whatever water flows over it, the river remains the same. So this is kind of, in a sense, the philosophical world into which Christianity is born. Um, and I say born, it comes out of Judaism, but it was also deeply connected with Greek, Hellenistic Greek thinking and philosophy. So there are some problems with simple monotheism. Uh, to just to simply assert Jesus, you know, one God, and just leave it at that. For Christians, and not for Jews, not for, not for anyone else, but for Christians. You see, in Scripture, and it's one of those places where we look to the, the evidence the, that we have, we have a number of f depictions of Jesus being God, Jesus being equal to God. Uh, the beginning of John's Gospel, which is part of a creation story. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So that's clearly, the, you know, that's Jesus. Uh, throughout John's Gospel, we see that that's Jesus. And we see that Jesus, John is asserting right at the beginning of the Gospel that Jesus was God. Uh, there are some people who, who doubt that particular... Um, verse uh i the problem with doubting that particular verse is it relies on G john saying jesus was a god uh which is kind of going back to the early you know 800 900 bc israel uh, and by this stage monotheism is the accepted norm for for jews uh and, and philosophical monotheism um they just there would be no room for John to go, oh, no, there's lots of gods. He just, that's too big a step. Um, now, John's gospel has the clearest depiction of the divinity of Jesus. But it's not just John's gospel. Uh, I grabbed one from the synoptics. So remember, Matthew, Mark and Luke are the synoptic gospels. Uh, and Jesus says, uh, and he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Now, if you hurt me, I can forgive your sins against me, but I can't forgive your sins against God. And yet uh, this is part of a healing. And so it's understood as Jesus is forgiving the sins that only God can forgive. Jesus is not saying God forgives your sins. Jesus is saying your sins are forgiven. Only God can forgive those sins that are against God. Um. And then even Paul. Now, now Paul's actually writing earlier than Luke, uh, who's writing earlier than John. So we're going back in time here. P 
Paul in his in Second Corinthians says three times I appealed to the Lord about this that it would leave me, but He said to me. So He's talking about um, the thorn in His side or something like that, uh, and and He's clearly indicating that He's praying to Jesus. Uh, Paul, Paul's a Jew, you know a Jew, uh, but he's a Jew who sees that in Jesus there is God. Now Paul possibly wouldn't have been Trinitarian, he might have been Binitarian, he might have, because you know, it, it takes a little longer for, for the Holy Spirit theology to develop, the pneumatology. Um, so we, we have these very clear indicators in Scripture that when we're talking about Jesus, we're talking about God. And there are, there are plenty more. There are the I am statements. Um, there are the nature miracles where, where Jesus commands a storm. You know, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, so they so they they scattered through the gospel through the gospels and through Paul's letters. I just chose three. On the other hand, in those same writings, there are a number of places where we see that Jesus is not God. Um, one of the, the the sort of the biggest is right towards uh, near the crucifixion, in Matthew twenty six. Um, we have Jesus, and you, you're probably familiar with the story. They've just had the Last Supper, um, you know, and they've gone out to to the Garden of Olives, or the Mount of Olives, uh, and Jesus says to them, "Sit here while I go there and pray." So prayer is is about communing with God in some way. So it makes no sense if you just look at that snippet that Jesus is God because. Who does God pray to? It just it, it doesn't make sense. Um, and and Jesus has many of the, the the failings and the frailties and the weaknesses. So not only do we get a depiction of Jesus growing up, but we get a depiction of Jesus being tired. He's tuckered out. They they you know they're traveling um, in John chapter four. They're traveling through Samaria. This is the story of the, the Samaritan woman at the well, and it starts with Jesus sitting there saying. I don't suppose you could get me a drink of water, please. Roughly, I'm paraphrasing. So, the why does God need a drink of water? Now you could say, oh, you know, it's just a part of the dialogue to kind of engage. But, but at the end of the day, we have a depiction of Jesus needing human sustenance, human beings. Um, and then on in Mark chapter fifteen. Uh, at three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is, in a sense, now, later theologians will talk about this being God experiencing brokenness that people experience all the time. But if we just took that snippet, if we, we see that as, as there's a distinction between Jesus and Godhood, and so we, we have evidence that runs both ways. And you can do these same things with uh, the Holy Spirit um, in terms of places where we see the Holy Spirit as being God with us and then places where we see the, a distinction between the Holy Spirit and God. So what happens is a number of people come up with a whole range of ways to reconcile this. The in a sense, the important thing, though, or one of the important things, I mean, there's a lot of important things, um, is the first thing is to, to recognize that w all these things happen after the scriptures are written. So there is nowhere in the Bible f is there a clearly expressed Trinitarian theology. The word Trinity is not used. It's not surprising. It comes from Latin. Um, but even the Greek equivalent or the Hebrew equivalent isn't there. Um, so what it is, is it's a matter of, it's a, it's a theological answer to the question, how do we deal with this apparent intractable tension between Jesus is God, Jesus is not God, there can be only one God, there are three experiences of God. Uh, and so, 
yeah, the, the Trinitarian theology is just people kind of trying to wrap their heads around that. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Um, so a couple of things get explored uh, and rejected. Uh, and if you've got the notes, I've got the little, the illusion, if you will, of the rabbit and the duck. And it, are you, do you see the rabbit or do you see the duck? Um, and can you switch between them? Can you flick your brain like that? Ooh, exciting. Um, and, and what it does is, is that diagram kind of splits up the the areas that are sort of proposed as being alternatives to Trinitarian theology. And each of them fails. So uh, modalism is probably the one that, in a sense, we most often uh, come across. And what that is, is the... Uh, you know, when, when people make come up with metaphors. Now, no metaphor is perfect, it just because otherwise it wouldn't be a metaphor. Uh, metaphors foreground different things. They, they, they remove certain nuances and distinctions. And when we look at Trinitarian theology, we often come up with metaphors to help people understand. And we understand that they're all imperfect. One of the ones that's often used is kind of a relational one. And I like the relational component. Uh, but it's, you know, it's like me. So I am father i've got three kids i'm also a husband i'm married to louise uh and i'm also a son i have parents and so god is like a uh, a father a son and and uh, and a husband and it's relational you can see that but at the end of the day i am my father nature is not distinct from my son nature is not distinct from my Holy Spirit from my um, my husband nature. Um, Andrew as a as a husband doesn't ask Andrew as a father for uh, help. It just doesn't work that way. There's no distinction in essence or substance. Perhaps an accident, but, but yeah, even an accident. I, I don't look different. So there's no distinction in substance. There's no distinction in who I am. The other um, model that's often presented is is one of a family, of a, a mum and a dad and a and a kid. But those are three distinct. So you've got the three separate persons, but you don't have that unity of substance. Um, and so one is modalism. The first one's modalism. The second one is tritheism, three separate, distinct beings, gods. And in the model of the family, you would have one who was born first. Uh, so, so they would be the first one. Um, subordinationism is, is one of the other ones that's looked at but isn't quite uh, there. Um, and so what that does is it sees God the Father as sort of the real God, and then the Son and the Holy Spirit as sort of second-tier gods. Um, or uh, quite often they are then part of the they are part of creation. Uh, they are created. Um, and some of those would even see Jesus as being, uh, in a sense, adopted. So he was doing a great job as a human being, and God adopted him uh, in his baptism, perhaps. Subordination. That's also where things like Arianism, if you're ever looking for your, her for your various favorite heresies, Arianism is in there. Um, then there's uh, panentheism, uh, which is essentially that uh, God becomes God only through the incarn through the incarnation. And so all of the universe finds itself in God, but this is how God becomes God. And there's kind of no distinction in that space. Uh, there, there's no uh, distinctiveness between God and crea creation. Um, that might also just be considered to be pantheism in a, in, in a slightly different phraseology, but not quite. So... When it comes to Trinitarian theology, it's really easy to get it wrong. Um, 
I, I remember when I was at St. Francis College, uh, we had to write our own creeds. And um, a couple of us were really, you know, we did a little bit of group work. There were four of us. We wrote stuff out. We went and showed it to one of our lecturers. And um, he looked at it for about four seconds and went, oh, that's nice. You've only got two heresies in there. Um, <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. Uh, and we were tritheistic and um, uh, monarchical, which is we had a, a layering of uh, the persons of the Trinity. So, you know. We, we, I mean, we, we gave it a, a go, but we failed. Uh, so, Trinitarian theology is, is, is complicated. Theologians bring different bits and pieces of language to it to try and help us understand it, and also to think about how it might be important. Um, one of those is this Greek term, perichoresis, um, which is often used around Trinitarian theology. And it kind of means, it's often just, people use this beautiful flowery language of it's the dance of the persons of the Trinity. Um, but what it's about is essentially uh, the mutual self-enclosing uh, of the persons of the Trinity. So, uh, the re what, what's the phrasing here? The, reciproc they, the persons of the Trinity reciprocally contain one another so that one permanently envelops and is permanently enveloped by the other that they envelop. So um, it's this idea of, you know, we are in God and God is in us because we are Christ's disciples, um, and but in a far more intimate way. So that's part of the language that's used. And it's it's beautiful language because it also talks to a kind of a, an ongoing dynamic uh, relationship within the person of God, within the personhood. Um, the other language you'll sometimes come across is the economic and imminent trinity. Uh, and in a sense, this gets back to substance and accident, in fact. The imminent trinity uh, focuses on, on who God is, so how God is within God's self. The economic trinity focuses on what God does. So... The, the economic trinity might be understood as in terms of uh, how we experience God. So we might experience God in the Holy Spirit. Historically, we have experienced God in, in Jesus Christ, uh, in, in, in the person of Jesus Christ. And so that's, that's the economic, the, the outworking of. Now, it also very quickly raises a f that there's a false dichotomy in a sense, because everything that God that any one person of the Trinity does is an action of the Trinity, uh, but it's a particular action of one particular uh, person of the three persons of the Godhood. Was that cool? Was that clear? I uh, hope so. Um, <laughs> and then um, one of the things uh, I, I liked, um, and uh, this apparently comes from Augustine, I don't know if he got it from somewhere else, um, but he, he tried to put together, and I think this is important, um, the Trinitarian theology with an anthropology. So it can be really easy to sort of think of the Trinitarian theology as being, uh, you know, sort of obscure philosophical ideas that, that have no impact. Really easy to think that way. Um, but it asks the question, so what? Who cares? Where does the rubber hit the road in Trinitarian theology? And Augustine actually finds the rubber hitting the road uh, around love. And so he'll, he'll describe the Trinity as the, the lover, the beloved, and the love between them. And it's, you know, and so then when we express love, we are expressing our truest, uh, the truest reflection of us being made in the image and likeness of God. So, so it, that's where the rubber hits the road, and 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 I like that. You know, it's it's when we are expressing love, uh, it's that's where we are most truly reflecting the nature of God as Trinity. 
Uh, there are other places where it becomes significant. Uh, it becomes significant as a source for many people within Christianity of mystical contemplation. Uh, it becomes significant in terms of how we shape our prayers, uh, how we uh, think about our worship. Uh, and it also becomes important because it's, it's a, a positive affirmation of the distinctiveness of Christian thinking. This is something that is true of Christianity, but is not true of any other faith. And it, it, it doesn't denigrate other faiths. It's just this is a distinctive element of Christianity. And it is important to how we see God, how we see the world, all those sorts of things. Um, so it's important that we maintain and we continue to reflect on it. But we also need to be careful that it is so very easy to... Um, fall off the theological perch. Uh, so, I hope that was interesting and informative. As I've said, it's, it's yeah. Um, if you have any thoughts or questions, uh, I'll get you to, if anyone posts anything now, I gather there's a small delay, so, you know, um, I might have to respond to them later. And I will, as always, Put this on uh, YouTube and put a link to it on the parish website. So, thoughts, questions? I'm not seeing any come up at this stage. Uh, let's see if any came up through here. Uh, okay, so uh, economic trinity, God the verb, not just the noun. Oh, that's a, I like that distinction, yes. Um, so the economic trinity is the, is the doingness of God, and the imminent trinity, in a sense, is the nounness of God, the, 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 the thingness. I, I like that. Oh, and Reg is with us. It's good, it's good that you're able to join in this evening, Reg. Um, so that's a, I, I like that. Um, what was the phrase? Um, oh, I can't remember who it is now. That's shocking. But there's one theologian who suggests that human beings should be a gerund, uh, which is a noun that's only act, only the case uh, when it's active. Um, so we're only so we're only human beings when we are uh, doing as we should be doing. Um, yeah. Well, I think that's it in terms of questions that have come up. So I'll say, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you.